Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Sonia and we talk about health, lifestyle and travel. So today we're talking about tonsillitis and this is actually a two-part series. Part one is today where we talk about tonsillitis, what it is, signs and symptoms, how to treat it. And the second part is actually where my daughter Carly actually tells her story of glandular fever and tonsillitis where she was hospitalized for something like eight days, very unwell in her last year of school sitting exams. So you won't want to miss out on that story because it's quite a little uh, ordeal and um, definitely was for us at that period of time. So Without further ado, subscribe below and let's get on with it. So what is tonsillitis? Tonsillitis is the inflammation of your tonsils. Any word with itis on the end means inflammation of. So appendicitis is inflammation of your appendix. Pharyngitis is inflammation of your pharynx. So you see what I'm saying. So itis means inflammation of. So now you know more medical terminology and you can work things out. How good is that? So definitely if you like information like this, subscribe below and hit the like button if you're liking what you're hearing. So tonsillitis is the inflammation of the tonsils. It's caused by two things, either viral or bacterial infection. Now, how do we prevent viral and bacterial infections? Well, it's a lot like what we're doing already with COVID-19. You know, it's all about hand hygiene. It's about cough and sneeze etiquette. You know, when we cough and sneeze, we cough in and sneeze into our elbow. We use hand hygiene if we've blown our nose or touched something where we think, that, you know, there may be before we eat and before we touch our face. So all those things actually help prevent um, organisms like bacterial and viral things from um, affecting us. So the tonsils are actually a barrier and are part of our immune system and like the first call really because they are our oronasopharyngeal, protect our airways. So that is why surgeons don't like to whip out your tonsils every time you say, I got a sore throat. No. So usually it's more than five or six episodes a year and then they will consider removing your tonsils. So what are the viruses that can infect your tonsils? These are things like the Epstein-Barr virus, it's influenza, it's the rhinovirus and a few others. The bacterial organisms that affect your airway and cause tonsillitis is group A streptococci. So we're initially going to talk about viral tonsillitis initially and that's the Epstein-Barr virus. Usually it can be well, it can be asymptomatic, meaning no symptoms, or it can be symptomatic, meaning the person has symptoms. So once the person has symptoms of that Epstein-Barr virus, it is then called infectious mononucleosis. Big word, hey? So, um, and the transmission is by saliva. So the transmission of this virus is by saliva, and it's called the kissing disease and usually affects 15 to 25 year olds. No, no guesses there why that might be. And um, I actually suggested to my daughter that maybe having a boyfriend in the last few months of high school was not a good idea. And um, maybe she should. Um, so yes, I'm not sure there, but I'm pretty sure that's how she got infectious mononucleosis. Anyway, so it is found in 90% of adults with viral tonsillitis and it affects 15 to 25 year olds. Uh, it seems to be 50 people per 100,000 in the population and Western societies actually get it. And you know, if it's 
easily manageable. It's treated with things like rest, pain relief, hydration and nutrition. Not a problem. However, if it becomes more complicated, then there is problems. So the signs and symptoms are things like redness of tonsils, inflammation and exudate, which is, you know, grungy stuff uh, that is white, yellow or grey. Oh, so many colours. Never a good thing, many colours. Uh, edema, which is swelling and pain. And the pharynx also gets inflamed. The viral symptoms are things like fatigue and malaise, um, headache, fever, uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, so starts to get swollen glands. And as you see in this picture here, um, my daughter actually has no eye sockets left and she's very swollen in the face. Uh, they can also, it can also affect their liver and their spleen. And that's why a person who has had um, diagnosed with glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis, uh, that's why they're told to be, have no contact sports or not to play sports for a number of weeks post-acute infection. And they can also suffer from things like um, lethargy uh, up to a few months later. So they need to take really good care of themselves. So the investigations are things like um, pathology, so taking blood, running screening on that, um, Epstein virus specific antibodies. And these don't always show up initially in the beginning of the infection but are usually present a week to two weeks later in the bloodstream and so it can be assessed. However, if they don't show up, then whoever's caring for that person needs to, you know, be aware of that and actually treat the symptoms as they progress and, you know, be, be on the ball because complications can um, cause airway obstruction. So... If, if that's happening, if the patient or the person's getting more sick, um, they're, they're, you know, they've got muffled voice, they've got heaps of swelling here um, in their face and neck, um, you know, they're drooling, they can't speak, um, you look in their mouths and you do an oral inspection and there's virtually no space for any air to get through. Well, you know, they need to go to hospital. They need to be reviewed by an ear, nose, throat person. They also need steroids to help reduce the swelling. They need IV fluids as for hydration because usually they haven't been drinking like they should have. They'll be put on antibiotics as well. And if the swelling doesn't start to decrease and there's a problem, you know, that their airway, they're not going to be able to breathe, then they might need a tube inserted if one can be inserted to help them breathe, and that's called intubate, or in an emergency where they can't breathe and that can't happen, they'll actually do a tracheostomy. And really that shouldn't happen in this day and age if you're in a hospital and if you're seeking help before that. So... Usually the treatment for the Epstein-Barr virus is supportive um, and, you know, can be, you know, take, taken care of at home. I remember my sister had it when we were growing up and, you know, she turned, she turned yellow. She obviously had liver um, issues as well. And, you know, she just did a lot of sleeping and a lot of um, hydration and pain relief. I remember that, which was totally different to my daughter's scenario that you'll hear about in part two of this series. So what is a bacterial infection? A bacterial infection is caused by the group A, beta hemolytic streptococci. And early recognition, again, is important. It's spread by saliva and nasal secretions. So cough and sneeze etiquette, again, important. Uh, and it can be like two to five days of no symptoms at all. And then bang, sudden onset of fever, sore throat, red and enlarged tonsils with purulent exudate or ooze. Um, they can have difficulty swallowing, they can have pain on swallowing and of course, you know, 
again, all the signs and symptoms of having difficulty speaking, drooling, all those sorts of things. So investigations, again, is blood tests um, and definitely treating the person with antibiotics. And depending how bad that is, they too might need to be hospitalized and have IV antibiotics and IV fluids as well for hydration. So tonsillitis is termed as recurrent or chronic. What's the difference? Well, recurrent tonsillitis is that which occurs a few times a year. But in between those times, you're well. There's, you know, you go on, there's nothing wrong with you and until the next attack. So usually if you have five or six of those in a year, a surgeon will consider removing your tonsils. But if it's less than that, they won't. Chronic tonsillitis is when you have a sore throat greater than three months and you know you can experience things like uh, sleep apnea at night where your airways obstruct. That's not a good thing to be happening uh, and definitely if there's something there it could be something like cancer and needs to be investigated further and if that is the case of course more surgery will be involved than a simple tonsillectomy. So I hope this has been informative. I hope you learned some new things. And don't forget to listen out and subscribe so that you know when part two comes up and you get to hear my daughter's own personal story and it should be very interesting. Okay, so bye for now. See you next time.